Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the online workshop organized by the Music Project. Today's workshop will present and discuss the outlook for advanced biofuels to decarbonize maritime transport with a special focus on the prospects of using pyrolysis oil-based fuels. The marine sector is almost entirely fossil-based and its fuel consumption is in the order of 300 million tons of, of fuel oil per year. Considering the associated greenhouse gas emissions and their climate impact, decarbonization of the sector is both important and urgent. Today, we have four impressive speakers that will shed light on the topic. They represent various sectors covering policy, maritime transport industry, maritime fuel providers, and a fuel technology provider. And our speakers are Dr. Maria Giorgiadou from the European Commission, Jacob Soyton from uh, Marsk, Felipe Ferrari from Good Fuels, and my co colleague Patrick Goemerman from Biomass Technology Group. And after the uh, speaker presentations, uh, Rainer Janssen from WIP will be the moderator of a roundtable that will conclude today's workshop. As already mentioned, uh, the workshop today is organized in the context of the European funded music project. MUSIC is an acronym for Market Uptake Support of Intermediate Bioenergy Carriers, and IBCs are densified biomass energy, similar to coal and oil. IBCs are easier to store, transport and use than regular biomass. In the project, the market uptake of IBCs is facilitated, for example, by developing feedstock mobilization strategies, improved cost-effective logistics. John, sorry, just and trade one, your yeah. presentation is not in presentation mode. Oh my dear. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Is that, oh, I, I'm not changing. Oh, stop share. Sorry, John. Is it okay now? Now it's fine. Okay. Sorry, people, uh, something went wrong here. Um, Okay, I just told you about our speakers today that they represent the different industries. Uh, I gave you a bit of a background on the music project, which is all about intermediate bioenergy carriers. And the music project will run until February next year. And it has a budget of just under 3 million euro. Um, all the participants are muted. Um, the webinar will be recorded. Questions you can raise through the virtual platform. Um, and we will try to answer all of your questions during the workshop itself. And the presentation slides, as well as the webinar recording, will be made available online afterwards. So far for my brief introduction. And I think I will now hand over to Rainer as moderator and to uh, Maria Giorgiadou, who will give the next presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, John. And also uh, welcome from my side to all participants. Um, um, as John said, we are very happy that we have uh, four distinguished speakers today that will shed light on uh, um, decarbonization of maritime transport through advanced biofuels from different angles. And uh, our first intervention uh, will come from uh, Maria Giorgiadu, who is Senior Project Officer at DG Research and Innovation at the European Commission. Her presentation will be on the current EU policy initiatives promoting sustainable maritime um, fuels. And I would like to add a word of thanks to, uh, to Maria for her many years of support uh, of, uh, uh, I would say, everyone uh, engaged in, uh, in uh, innovative bioenergy technologies um, from the policy side and also for, for your support and also for your interest in results from various European uh, projects. That's very much uh, appreciated and uh, gives a reason you know, for, for our work uh, if we see that this uh, is taken up with interest at the European Commission. Uh, many thanks, uh, Maria. Just maybe a further information to our participants. Maria, unfortunately, will need to leave at uh, 3.30. So in case you have any uh, urgent questions, we will allow a few minutes. Um, uh, don't keep them for later. Uh, she might not come back uh, today. <laughs> Maria, it's your floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Renier and John, uh, for this nice uh, introduction. Um, not to... Um, uh, spare more time, I will jump to the presentation. Um, uh, 
I think you can. You can yes, see. Yes, it's good now. Maria is okay. good. So um, I will uh, give you a little bit of the background uh, between uh, the. Um, what happens? It doesn't. It doesn't want to go down. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, first I will uh, give you a little bit of background uh, on the policy context and then on the research and innovation policy context to support these uh, particular sectors, uh, biofuels and uh, intermediate bioenergy carriers. So the overarching policy is the European Green Deal. The European Green Deal is a way to transform the EU's economy for a sustainable future intervening to all the economic sectors uh, in the energy, in the mobility, in the industry, in the buildings, and uh, also in the food uh, industry, and uh, actually taking care of the environment, the climate, the uh, biodiversity, and the pollution, financing the transition in a way not to leave anyone behind and create economic growth. Under this uh, overarching framework, we have specific strategies and laws like the climate law that was announced uh, last uh, year and has the 55% target of greenhouse gas emission savings in 2030 and climate neutrality in 2050. Also, it is the, uh, the European uh, energy system integration with specific references to renewables, to sustainable biomass and biofuels, to green hydrogen and to synthetic fuels. The hydrogen strategy, uh, also referencing production, distribution, and use of hydrogen and hydrogen-derived uh, fuels. Biodiversity strategy, which actually uh, relates uh, to the biofuel uh, uh, production uh, in a way to respect biodiversity and the sustainable and smart mobility uh, strategies. And uh, the delivery to this uh, European uh, Green Deal is done through the uh, package of legislative proposals called Fit for 55. These are uh, 15 uh, revised uh, existing legislative proposals and new proposals that are implemented in climate, in energy, in transport, in taxation and trade, together with the gas uh, uh, markets package that was uh, announced uh, last winter. All of them, most of them, are related uh, to the uh, biofuels and renewable fuels. Here I list the most important ones. Um, these are the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, the directive now has specific targets uh, for uh, advanced biofuels and biogas applied to transport, and uh, uh, for 2030, 2.2%, and for renewable fuels of non-biological origin, both hydrogen and hydrogen-derived fuels. Uh, of 2.6% in 2030, and most importantly, there is a target on uh, reducing emissions from energy supply to, tra to transport, renewable fuels and renewable electricity to 13%. This is quite important to achieve uh, those uh, emissions. We need quite uh, amounts that are quite uh, important for fuels. Other uh, regulations that are revised uh, have increased the targets for the greenhouse gas emission savings, like the revision of the effort sharing regulation or the emissions trading system, uh, which now is, ex uh, is expanded to cover maritime aviation, buildings and road transport from 2026 for the last uh, two. The LULU CF with an increased target quite significant for the uh, bio, um, for the um, sinks of uh, CO2 and two new proposals that are very relevant uh, to um, aviation and maritime. The one on aviation has specific targets of uh, um, sustainable alternative uh, fuels in aviation in 2013-2050, but the one in maritime has a specific uh, target for reducing the greenhouse gas content in the energy ships by 6% in 2030 and 75% in 2050 from the 2020 average. And this is going to be done through using uh, a sustainable alternative, alternative fuels, may, may, mainly biofuel, biogas, renewable fuel of non-biological origin and recycled carbon fuels. Uh, in this um, uh, way, they are going to contribute to the reductions. And another important uh, um, revision is the taxation uh, directive, which uh, has exemptions for uh, renewable electricity, for uh, 
uh, advanced biocures for renewable cures, for bioliquids, for biogases, and for biomass flares, actually for all the uh, intermediate bioenergy carriers. And um, the other uh, specific uh, policy that uh, now it is very, very relevant because of the energy crisis is called Repower EU. This is a joint European action for more affordable, secure, and sustainable energy. The communication was announced uh, on 8th of March, and next week we will have a communication on these uh, specific measures. Uh, this uh, plan uh, ha has the aim to increase the resilience of the EU's energy system by controlling the energy price, by securing our storage uh, for the next heating period, and by reducing the dependency on fossil fuel imports. This will be done through rolling up the production of biomethane and hydrogen, decarbonizing the industry and increasing the renewable energy use. So one thing is to speed up the permitting for renewable energy product, projects and grid infrastructure improvements. Another way is to uh, increase the rooftop solar panels, uh, the heat pumps and the energy savings. Uh, also to diversify the suppliers for the gas, including uh, 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 and other suppliers, as I said, also to, be, to double the EU biomethane goal to produce now 35 billion cubic meters per year by 2030. A whole action is on hydrogen accelerator for infrastructure and storage facilities and ports to provide 15 additional million tons of renewable hydrogen, five produced it, uh, domestically and 10 imported and decarbonizing the industry by switching of technologies to electrification or by switching the fuels to renewable fuels and renewable hydrogen. For the research and innovation, we have the Horizon Europe. The research and uh, innovation framework program from 2021 to 2027. Energy is in all parts of the Horizon Europe, from the defense to Euratom, but in the specific program implementing Horizon Europe and the European Innovation Technology, uh, we have um, energy appearing in three pillars, and particularly in pillar two under the cluster five that uh, combines climate, energy, and mobility research and innovation support actions. And together, they have a budget of 15 billion for the seven years, of course. And now, under this uh, cluster, and particularly for um, climate uh, for, uh, for a sustainable, secure, and competitive energy supply, the impact we would like to achieve is to have more efficient, clean, sustainable, secure, and competitive energy supply through new solutions, in employing more renewables and uh, smart grids. And there, one of the ways to achieve this impact is to foster the European global leadership in affordable, secure, secure and sustainable renewable energy technologies. For this, we have both renewable energy technologies, which means electricity and heat, and also advanced renewable fuels, because uh, these are uh, fuels that are both advanced biofuels and sustainable, um, advanced uh, and uh, renewable fuels uh, of non-biological origin that are needed to provide long-term carbon neutral solutions in the transport and in the energy intensive industrial sector. So we have activities to have available disruptive technologies and systems in 2050, and for short to mid term to have reduced cost and improved efficiency, to de risk more mature technologies and have their commercial exploitation. We have uh, actions for a better integration of, uh, uh, yeah, of these technologies in energy consuming sectors for the most effective market uptake of these technologies for reinforcing the European scientific basis and uh, export potential, and of course, all this under increasing and, and the sustainability of the value chains. Um, well, uh, I think the problem, it doesn't move. Ah, okay, move. So under the Horizon Europe, our program 21-22, we had uh, various topics uh, that cover renewable fuels and bioenergy. And uh, this cover all the PRLs from fundamental to demonstration topics and many technologies. Maria, sorry, can you try again? We're still stuck at the Horizon Europe cluster five slide. Now, I mean, I, I me, I'm, it, it rolls. Uh, you see this Horizon Europe cluster five. You see the Horizon Europe work program. No. 
No. Okay, so I'll try to reset. It is a post for some reason, which I don't understand. Can you see now or? Now it's fine, yes, thank you. So under the work program 2122, we have topics uh, on uh, processes and uh, specific technologies like uh, catalysis, uh, like uh, production of uh, negative uh, uh, emissions uh, biofuels, like uh, specific products like algae, biomethane, and uh, more systemic topics uh, like uh, value chain uh, 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 research and um, uh, production of biofuels in existing uh, infrastructure. Also, we have uh, uh, topics for uh, forestry and agricultural uh, residues that lead to intermediate bioenergy carriers and renewable energy carriers, uh, topics specific for all these carriers, and uh, topics on solar fuels and artificial photosynthesis. And on CHP, we have topics for um, heating, uh, for um, combustion and gasification, and renewable energy carriers for heating. Uh, in the next topic, we will have more specific for aviation and shipping uh, topics, both uh, at the demonstration uh, and uh, basic uh, uh, TRL. Now, the topics that I consider most relevant for uh, the discussion here are and that is going to be open uh, soon uh, and close uh, this year. It is one topic on demonstration of complete value chains for advanced biofuel and non-biological renewable fuel production. Uh, uh, this will close on the 27th of October. Another topic on the best international practice for scaling up sustainable biofuels. And the third one on the development of algal and renewable fuels of non-biological origin. I consider those are most relevant for the shipping sector from what is now available in the uh, um, next to open uh, uh, topics. And there is a topic under the waterborne transport uh, partnership, which is called transformation of the existing fleet towards green operations through retrofitting. And uh, it's a topic that uh, has some touch, let's say, to the use of uh, advanced biofuels and uh, this type of uh, bioliquids uh, in, in uh, the uh, waterborne transport. And the final um, mention is on mission innovation. This is another way of collaborating. Uh, the mission innovation uh, was launched uh, last uh, June and for the next decade will support investments in research and development and demonstration for clean energy, including for shipping. So we have uh, uh, two ways of collaborating for uh, biofuels and renewable fuels. And the innovation platform through a collaborative module, which is called innovation and for international sustainable aviation fuel, co-led by India and USA. And another one under missions. Missions are specific actions that bring together dynamic and delivery focused uh, high ambition alliances between countries, corporations, investors, and research institutions. And we have a mission specific on integrated bio refinery. It's a very recently launched, co-led by India and the Netherlands which has a goal to accelerate commercialization of integrated biorefineries to replace 10% of fossil-based fuels, chemicals, and materials with bio-based alternatives by 2030. Of course, um, the biorefineries to make, uh, including uh, shipping uh, biofuels, will be eligible, and there will be a follow-up action in the 23-24 uh, work program. The, as you see, there is a mission on shipping, but that mission on shipping is uh, mainly on uh, new ways of, uh, of shipping and, uh, and not uh, uh, so much on the production of the fuels for shipping. Um, I think this is all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for your attention. And um, I will be glad to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you very much, um, um, Maria.
um, for this nice overview presentation. I was uh, checking the chat, so so far there is no no question from the uh, from the chat. So I would uh, uh, open the floor to our uh, uh, panelists. Uh, any anything you would like to uh, uh, to ask Maria with respect to upcoming uh, policies on maritime transport? Anyone from the panel? I have a question, and uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, regarding the, the push from EU to, to, to facilitate uh, biofuels and shipping, are there any work going on to, to level the playing field between Europe and, and the rest of the world, being uh, US or, or other parts of the world? Uh, right now, what is going on is that, that there is no take up of this uh, fuel set commercial scale. And uh, this obviously creates uh, even more pressure on, on the gap, as you say, between what is going on here and elsewhere. But the, the commission now put forward what is called an alliance, uh, industrial alliance uh, on renewable and low carbon fuels, uh, including uh, aviation and shipping, basically for aviation and shipping. So uh, under this alliance, uh, there will be um, important, let's say, stakeholders coming together, trying to solve all these uh, barriers uh, for the uh, take up of uh, the technologies that are developed here in Europe and need to be scaled up. And uh, furthermore, uh, pushed uh, to the um, uh, sectors that are needing these, uh, these fuels for their greenhouse gas emissions uh, savings. So uh, I think uh, it is uh, Fuels Europe that uh, participates in this uh, alliance. Um, I don't remember the other uh, coordinator, but uh, all the stakeholders are uh, members and uh, are um, through one or the other way participating in um, the, the works of this alliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marie, if I, I may follow up now, obviously this question comes from an, from an internationally operating uh, <laughs> uh, uh, company. Um, is there like, uh, do you feel this is very strongly led by Europe or, or uh, do you need to push the others or, or are they, they joining more, more freely? Like in, in general, from, from looking at the, uh, the whole development for 20 years now, the shipping sector seems to be a latecomer, no? Do you, do you need to, to push the others or, or do you see help? You mean this question is for me? Yes, yes. To push who? Uh, uh, the, the other countries, the, the rest of the world. <laughs> well, the, this alliance is not an international alliance, it's a European alliance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. first of all. Now, for the international alliance, I showed you the mission innovation. There is the shipping. There is the shipping uh, mission there that uh, somehow uh, companies and international players will come uh, together to have a green shipping whatever this means. I mean, new ships, retrofitted ships, uh, fuels, um, all, all the solutions possible. Uh, so uh, if, if we need to push, uh, th there is now uh, something which is obligatory at EU level. I don't know exactly for what is the situation, how much is obligatory in the, in the world. As you say, they are international operating companies and it is difficult to, to make uh, uh, obligations um, affected. But we are trying, we are trying through the alliances, through the legislation, uh, through uh, this, uh, these measures uh, to push uh, more of uh, the greening of, of the shipping sector. Yeah, no, I, I can assume that we hear more from Jakob uh, about this, this topic in a, in a few minutes. I think so. In the, in no, I, I'll not, I'll not uh, touch much upon uh, regulation, but, uh, but, but just a comment. I mean, uh, the, the, the new uh, Fit for 55 includes uh, ETS covering marine, as I understand it, uh, and that will give quite a, quite a high ca carbon tax for shipping um, for, for all uh, shipping within Europe and about 50% of shipping uh, going between Europe and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that could mean that it could make sense for a company like us to, to change routes cross Atlantic to go into, for example, UK and then uh, um, reload and go for, for shorter routes from UK to Europe because uh, the, the tax will enforce that. But uh, I, I don't hope that that will happen, but, but it could be an incentive to, to do that. 
but the taxation directive uh, also includes some proposals to tax the shipping sector. So uh, this means that you could consume more fuel if you choose other routes. So you will have to pay more taxes. So you will have to see whether this is uh, better than uh, adjusting and putting a little bit more greener ways uh, fuels uh, in, in your operations. So uh, yes, there is, uh, as I say, a, a way of uh, um, trying to convince the, the sector to go to, to greener solutions. Mm -hmm. Energy efficiency also is something that will play a role. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Maria. So, um, oh yeah, Patrick, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just uh, yeah, since you are obviously uh, a lot closer to the fire than than we are, so to speak, uh, there are of course been serious developments in the last uh, two months with respect to the uh, the, the war and uh, the uh, energy crisis. You you called it. Um, can you shed some light or on on uh, how the thinking is in in EU policy? Uh, is actively policy being made to alleviate those uh, crises? Yes, I showed you the Repower EU. This is the subject of our discussions uh, since uh, this energy crisis uh, appeared through the war, as you say. Um, so in the short term, because this is something you are asking, you're asking now, in the short term, there will be a diversification of gas supplies, uh, switching to, uh, for example, LNG, <coughs> and um, uh, pushing for uh, for, as it was announced in the communication phase of Mars, we need to diversify the gas suppliers in order to uh, prepare for the next uh, heating period. Um, and now, also immediately to roll out uh, uh, renewables that are there, most uh, capable of giving uh, the electricity that is needed uh, for um, the, uh, reducing uh, the dependence on the inputs, like the solar and the wind, basically. Um, then it will be an, uh, a little bit longer term for the hydrogen, a lot of push in uh, the hydrogen accelerator to produce uh, hydrogen, to have hydrogen infrastructures, to use hydrogen and to distribute hydrogen, a lot of uh, effort on, on that. And uh, as I said, permitting, permitting uh, on renewable energy project, projects and their infrastructure. Also, this is something that will be facilitated in the short term, and uh, the diversification of the ways of uh, the energy uh, uh, in industry, like uh, switching from uh, the current technologies of using uh, fossil for uh, heating to electrification, or switching from fossil to other uh, RFNDOs or uh, hydrogen. So these are ways uh, that uh, will be put forward. Of course, energy savings and efficiency come first, and then uh, we have the preparedness, and then we have also the, uh, the other measures that I mentioned. So yes, this is the hot topic. And next week, you will have a communication on how this all will be done. Just a quick follow-up, Maria. This communication uh, was not planned eh, without the war. Is this... Oh, this? This I have no way to know. OK. <laughs> this I, I have no way to know. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, um, we only have two minutes uh, of Maria's time left, but I, uh, usually we have uh, stakeholders asking the, uh, the commission representatives. Now I would like to turn it around, uh, Maria, you have two more minutes. What would you like to, uh, to see from, from our industry representatives in the podium in the, in the next months and years? Uh, like you have, uh, we have the uh, large transport sector, Maersk, uh, we have uh, technology developer, BTG, and uh, we have good fuels, we have the sort of value chain uh, managers and fuel suppliers. What should they do? What, what, would is, you wish? Important, what is important uh, for, uh, for us uh, is to show that uh, biofuels, advanced biofuels, sustainable biofuels, and the intermediate bioenergy carriers can be a means uh, of uh, um, greening, let's say, the shipping operations. In the work program, I didn't mention, but we have a procurement study. We have a procurement study for how to um, 
uptake uh, uh, fuels, uh, uh, buzz bio fuels in uh, shipping and ideation, that it, uh, it, I think the tender is open no? and uh, um, submissions of the tender to the tender uh, are ongoing, meaning that we are very serious of uh, really pushing these technologies uh, to shipping and aviation, of course, but also to shipping. Um, I mentioned the, the, the alliance. So what we want is participation of the industry and the, the providers, of course, the technology providers uh, participate. Uh, also, if the industry participates in taking up this technology. So I, what I would like to see is uh, participation in the uptaking of uh, these uh, new technologies uh, in the shipping sector, proving that they are uh, sustainable, they are reliable, and they can be uh, used in the longer term. And not only biofuels, it is also biomethanol, it is also biomethane. And uh, we have many, many, many topics. Another aspect is also ammonia, renewable ammonia. Uh, this is for the, for the longer term. We would like really to see uh, support from, uh, from the industry in uptaking these technologies. Okay, good. Um, so you were heard now, um, uh, Maria. You're you're off to your your next meeting. So all the all the best for. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you again. Us. For have a very joining. nice uh, work. Okay. I will see the recordings because I'm very interested in the topic, but unfortunately, okay. I do not have time. Yeah, yeah. In in case you come back, just link on in again. Uh, otherwise, all yes. The best. Uh, <laughs> Thank, you. So. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Yes, so um, um, with this very nice interaction with Maria, and again, what I mentioned before, uh, um, Maria is always very supportive uh, for for the sector and also very approachable. You could uh, you could also see during the uh, the discussion now. So in case uh, for all uh, obviously panelists and, and all uh, um, um, participants in the in the workshop, Maria is is approachable uh, for for questions of any kind. So she she likes people working on on solutions. Um, with that, uh, I would like to invite uh, Jakob Zoitzen uh, to give um, uh, the second presentation of our workshop. Uh, Jakob is a senior, uh, senior Future Fuels Manager at Maersk Decarbonization uh, and Future Fuels, and he will talk about biofuels as a merit, uh, marine fuel solution to decarbonize shipping, so the topic of our, uh, of our workshop. Uh, however, from one of the, the largest players in, uh, in the world, you know, on, on shipping. And as I mentioned before, uh, it was about time, you know, <laughs> that your sector is also uh, uh, joining the, uh, the, the group. So we look forward to, to hear information from your side. Jakob, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Anna. And I'll try to share my presentation. Uh, let's see how that goes. Um, but uh, while I do that, I can start uh, talking. Um, um so um can you see anything now because i cannot uh it's not uh and not uh, not in presentation mode so i can see my presentation now can you do, do that now it's fine excellent what do you see now it's fine now like it should be um i cannot even hear you now so uh what do you do about that? Okay, hey, Jacob, it's it's all right. Um, just a moment. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, we can hear you, and uh, but. The, the the presentation it I was cannot hear you at all. Oh, we can hear you. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot hear. You. I cannot hear. Can you try one of the other participants? Yeah, Ryan, I can hear Jacob. Yes, yes, same, same me actually. Um, 
So uh, should we, uh, John, invite Philippe to give his presentation and Jakob will join in and out? Yeah, I think that's the solution. Eh? If Jacob cannot hear us. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, I can hear you now again, but okay. I, I cannot I cannot access. So uh, I will try to do my best if you take the other presentation first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, Yes, so uh, with, uh, with this, uh, I would now like to introduce uh, Felipe Ferrari, uh, who is a long-term innovation lead at Good Fuels, and he will uh, give a presentation on prospects experiences from marine biofuel trials. And uh, Good Fuels is a very interesting uh, organization because uh, you, you are setting up actually value chains. You're, you're providing uh, fuels you're uh, bringing together the the stakeholders and uh, as we have just discussed um, it is a uh, it is um, yeah uh, uh, a future challenge uh, how to bring the fuels to the market and uh, you make such uh, innovative fuels available Felipe uh, and now I'm crossing fingers yeah okay <laughs> so, <laughs> so. I can hear you properly uh, I I expect that the same the same holds true on your side. So yes, yes. Know. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for kind words uh, on introducing myself and also good fuels. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. Can you all see that? Uh, yes, it's wonderful. Great. So again, I'd like to thank you the kind words for introducing myself and especially Good Fuels. And uh, I would say that indeed, this is our, our capability. This is one of our strength is not the biofuel per se. Of course, this is one of our strengths. But I think that if I could highlight one uh, position uh, would be the integration of the value chain. So how to put everyone speaking on the same language, uh, how to make uh, impact out of that, how to put that into a perspective for the common public as well. So really making everyone together toward this challenge that is energy transition. Uh, just to put some perspective into that. So the challenge, uh, pretty much those are numbers from the IMO. So we have a challenge of a 40% of reduction in the emissions for 2030 and 50 on the terms of a GHG reduction by 2050 uh, proposed by IMO. Uh, we are looking forward how uh, the upcoming steps are going to settle, especially the integration of the shipping or the maritime sector into the ETS uh, market. But what is even more challenging that we are proposing reduction to a sector that are, is expected to increase. So actually, if we continue the business as usual, as we are used to do so, uh, instead of reducing the emissions, we are going to increase them by 90 to 130 uh, percent on the base on the baseline. Uh, and of course, uh, we have different strategies to achieve in that, 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 uh, that those numbers, those challenges, and it's important that we address all of them. Uh, on the right side, you can see how they might cope with, uh, with one each other. And yeah, a large share is still uh, relying on low carbon fuels. But I can imagine from a ship owner perspective or a logistic operators that we are in a moment of uncertainty. So what should we do? Let's go for those that are specialists in market and in statistics and in studies. And here bring two perspectives of 2050 uh, for, forecast of the energy matrix from two uh, very unknown institutions. And yeah, they just differ from each other. So how we can do, how can we move forward? So what direction should we go? And on the top of that, we also have different uh, greenhouse gas emissions attributed to different energy carriers and to different fuels. So how can we address, how, how can, can, we can we choose uh, among the options that we might have? Uh, yeah, and this how we do. So this, we try always to question the five points on the left. So is it sustainable? Does it work? Is it affordable? Is it available? And is it scalable? 
because of course that we need to look into the future as well and which kinds of options that we might have up there but we need to understand that the the the, the work sti started yesterday so we we really need to address the fleet that are already current operating and biofuels actually is the only viable solution to to, to address the fleet that is just uh, available commercially uh, operating so what we do as a, as as you mentioned in the beginning rainer uh, we try to co-develop the product uh, so I, we can bring what is the most effective out there towards our clients uh, we also build the business case. We help on the market development. So, and of course, we, we support the whole segment, not only our own business, but everyone that is related to that. We, we try to connect to the legislation and also to the European Commission to inform, provide, provide data, and also to support of our own vision on the things that are happening, connecting people, branding, and putting all our effort to build up this, this, this business. Uh, we have a sister company, it's Good Shipping. Together, we can manage and really tailor our solutions to our clients. So we address the scope one, the scope three emissions. Uh, so we can really cope uh, and provide solutions on the carbonization and on the on fuse uh, approach. Uh, and yeah, I started by saying sustainability, and uh, we have the first the first presentation talking a lot on sustainability, and we believe that it's important to have independent members on our institutions to address sustainability because they are just disconnected from the business. So it's a safe way to to not go for biased decisions so we have a su independent sustainability board to support us on our decisions which feedstock should we go for uh, which kind of technologies so it's really the first goal that we that we need to aim for is the sustainability and we give a lot of attention into that because we know how many preconceptions are, uh, surround biofuel so we really need to address them in a mature way uh, we started in 2015. Our first bunker was together with Boscales, uh, a partner that is still uh, together with us nowadays. Uh, at that moment, our first bunkering was 30-70% uh, bio blend. We used at that moment the HVO, uh, following a norm that is much superior that is necessary nowadays. Was we were following diesel norms uh, from road and. Yeah, uh, was using our style of our stroke engine. And this is how we started. Used cooking oil was the feedstock that we used at that moment. It's still within our portfolio. Today, we have other uh, kinds of feedstock as well. And this is how we moved forward. So in 2015, our first bunkering, and we we and we were born. And we moved step by step, gaining knowledge on this path and expanding our portfolio. For example, in 2018, we came with the first biofuel oil kind that we provided in the market. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we just expanded with another office in Singapore because we believe that it's important to have an international approach toward the marine business as well. And we are always looking forward and to the future. So what are, what, what can we expect from the other fuels? So we understand the importance of uh, electrofuels, uh, alternative fuel carriers, non-biological origin. Uh, we understand the importance of, of all of them. But again, we need to address uh, the fleet that is uh, today. Uh, and this is our core business, which is fuel biofuel. And yeah, we always say that biofuels are dropping, but it's it is, it is a real drop in. So I separated two studies that I want to share with you. This first one is uh, it's a work that was published in a very responsible journal. And, and it was conducted, they said it was conducted in our first trial in Singapore. So it was the first time that a biofuel was bunkered for seagoing ships in Singapore. Uh, so the idea was to really do a, an assessment of pipe emissions and life cycle emissions of biofuel and what kinds of things that might outcome from using a, a biofuel in a regular fossil made engine on a on a commercial scale on a fuel scale uh, trial so the ship was bunkering in singapore 
the, the, the voyage was settled to La, Las Palmas in Spain territory. Uh, the fuel that they were that they used was a blend of 50-50 biofossil. Uh, they use our MDF-1 uh, 100. So was our MDF-1 is our distillate equivalent biofuel that we have. Uh, and we and they followed the ISO 181708 uh, that relates to the emission measurements and the method that we need to address, uh, coping with all the modes of operation from that slow ahead until the full navigation ahead. And what is important to highlight that no adjustments were made in the engine. So the, one, the engine was running as it would be in a regular fossil, uh, fossil fuel. Even though, of course, if you, if you address MAN, for example, they will suggest that you should adjust your engine based on the fuel that you are using. So if you are pretending to use always biofuel would be nice to have the adjustments using biofuel but on the same document they highlight that if you don't have uh, the fuel available for making the adjustments you can use the profile um, values that you have from fossil equivalent so still uh, you can do the same adjustments that you have for a regular fossil uh, the, 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 the vessel was equipped with a ML uh, engine to stoke to two strokes diesel that is compliant with IMO tier two for NOx emissions. And the measurements were done in, uh, after and before the silence, just to cope with potential particularities that might come from that. And yeah, and as expected, the pipe emissions, because the fuels, they are pretty much similar uh, on, a, on a fuel level or on the performance level or what you can have out of them. So if you normalize following the norms, all the, the operation modes, no significant changes in the emissions for CO2 and NOx was observed. If you break it down into the specific operation modes, you might see slightly deviations both on CO2 and NOx, whether favoring bio blend or the fossil equivalent, but the authors highlight that those differences are within the, var the variations expected for the, for, the, for the assessment. So summing up, no difference were observed in the emissions of NOx and CO2, but the sulfur emissions as expected as well, because the biofuel just had lower, vol and lower quantities of sulfur, so it was expected to have lower emissions of sulfur as well. And the emissions are just not lower because it was a half uh, percent blending. So roughly speaking, this, the sulfur emissions were half of the blend in comparison to the fossil. However, when you look to the life cycle emissions, and this is the advantage of biofuel, renewable fuel, alternative fuels, and this is how we, we need to look at the emissions when addressing uh, renewable fuels and sustainable fuels are the life cycle emissions uh, that accounts for the complete value chain. And we can see that the emissions are much lower just because you have a more, uh, a lower carbon intensity value chain. And uh, it's halfly, it's, almost, it's not half of the emissions because the, 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 the blending already had some fossils so that will increase the, the carbon load of the, the trial. But they made an exercise as well, that is the bottom chart. Uh, and they consider three different scenarios. One, business as usual, so you don't have any CO2 mitigation. The second one that you can see 280 tons was the total amount that they saved during the trial. So the, the biofuel that they had was for a trial, was not for the entire voyage. And the third, the third scenario, that is 3,200 tons, is how much they would have saved on CO2 emissions if they the entire voyage would have been filled with the biofuel blend. So this is really the advantage of using a biofuel and a sustainable biofuel is when we look at the life cycle emissions. Of course, for some particular emissions as, as sulfur content, they are also very beneficial at first glance, but uh, the life cycle are the important way of looking into, the, into biofuels because this is how we benefit from them. 
The second study is more, it's a report provided by Lloyd. Uh, actually what they did, they consolidated different uh, studies, some of them using our biofuel as well. Uh, and they use the, the, the studies that were complying with the norm. So because to do those assessments on emissions, you need really to have like a steady state uh, uh, engine load uh, momentum so you can really compare the different loads or the, dif the different fuels. So they selected the do, studies. Uh, two minutes. Oh, sorry. Uh, they selected yeah. the studies and they also saw that the variations were within the, 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 the what was expected from the analysis. And what I would like to highlight is that no specific modifications were done and no different outcomes in the engines were observed by using biofuel. No difference in the pistons, no difference in the seals, no difference were observed. So it's a real uh, drop in. And to take away uh, what I would like to highlight is what we saw during our lifespan, things that might threaten the biofuel uptake so it's important that we address uh, the lack of te technical standards. So we have been built internally our own technical standards to address specifically the, the biofuels. So some specifications that are not within ISO, for example, price barrier. So it's important to cope with that. So it's important to have a legislation and legal framework to support and incentivize the biofuel uptake because it's just more expensive. <laughs> Uh, it's important to, hit, to have a need, uh, a clear sustainable criteria, internationally speaking, so we can really compare the different fuels on the same level of norms and use. Uh, the danger of technology locking, so we, we should always look for the, for the GHD mitigation and not for one particular technology rather than other. So we need to focus on the goal. Uh, we need to cope with international regulation for international shipping to make all the markets together. They, they need to dialogue and uh, to bound everything together. We need to really a uh, structure framework, legal framework, just to glue and to grease everything to make the engines just smooth on the energy transition. Uh, this is my contact. Feel free to reach me anytime it you, suits you the most. And let's make waves together. Yeah, <clears throat> many thanks, um, uh, Felipe, for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, I'm checking the uh, the chat. Um, um, I don't see anything, John. I think same is true for you. Yeah. Uh, so I will do the uh, the same as before. Do, do we have any any quick questions from the the other panelists? I have one question regarding the emissions. Uh, I agree on the conclusions you, you mentioned, but how about particular information? Uh, was that something you measured, and is it something that you're worried about? That we, the particular matter, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we are concerned about that because as sulfur, uh, as the sulfur content, something that is really straightforward a measurement and you have very restricted zones of emissions. For those particular studies, the particular matter was not addressed, but we do the particular matter assessment by our own as well. Uh, regularly speaking, when you have oxygen in the molecular chain of the fuel, so because we have some fame, so ethyl esters, that copes with the reduction of the, the, the particulate matter. Generally speaking, uh, biofuels, because they are cleaner in comparison, to have, uh, not even compare with heavy oil, because heavy oil just has a lot of particular matter emission, but on the other fuels, uh, so the cleaner, the cleaner fuels, they are whether equivalent or better in a particular matter emission. So this is also something that copes with the norms and also yeah, the, the, the emission zones. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Felipe, I, I would also have a question. And uh, my, my question is, when you're looking at the value chain now, uh, do you have uh, more uh, potential customers or more available fuel <laughs> in the moment? Where is the, uh, <laughs> the bottleneck? No, because I can uh, I can recall uh, with your colleagues from Sky Energy that at some point uh, they had a lot of airlines uh, uh, that are doing a similar approach on the in the aviation uh, fuel field. At some point they had a lot of airlines that wanted to uh, uh, to use the fuels, but there was not enough fuels in the market. What is the the current situation in the maritime? Uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of a trade-off. 
on expansion level, now we are expanding operation, we feel that we need more feedstock. We need more uh, from the fuel side, from the fuel supply. So for today, I would say that we need more fuel than we need clients. Of course, the clients are always welcome. So that might change with the economic perception. Nowadays that we have, now that we might have incentives for other kinds of uh, energy production, might using the same feedstock that the biofuel, maybe something might change. Uh, but yeah, today I think that is the fuel, uh, especially because we need to use what we have in Europe to the most as we can. And that's why, for example, BTG technology is so, uh, it's so desirable for a price scale up uh, so we can cope with the internal market and the, and with the internal offer as well. Yeah, very nice. I, I saw Patrick smiling, eh? but uh, still, uh, uh, still, Jacob, should we, uh, uh, many thanks. Uh, uh, Felipe will might come back to a few issues later during the, the roundtable. Uh, Jacob, are, you, we, are we brave enough to try again? Uh, yes, surely. I hope I proved since last time. Can I try? Uh, please. So uh, let's see if this works. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. Yep. Can you see my presentation now? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, when I put on my presentation, the sound uh, disappears, but uh, but let's go. So uh, I, I want to, to, to tell you about the choice of fuel that, that we are considering in Maersk. Um, and I don't think I need to, to, to introduce Maersk as uh, being a shipping company, but we are a shipping company um, that has been operating since uh, 1904. So a very old company, and it's also one of the major shipping companies, specialized, especially in container shipping. But we also have uh, Maersk tankers, and we have different other types of shipping. But the, the main concern for us is the container business, because it emits a lot of uh, CO2. So. In 2018, the company set out to be uh, climate neutral by 2050. Uh, and that's quite an ambitious uh, target. Uh, be before they did that, they had actually managed to, uh, I, I should say that I joined the company last year, so I was not part of that. But uh, be before then, they had been able to, uh, to reduce uh, the, the footprint of uh, one container ship by 46%. And that was uh, due to mainly in energy efficiency and due to the ships uh, being uh, quite, quite a lot uh, larger than they used to be. Um, but but uh, reducing the energy, uh, uh, the, the, the carbon footprint of one container is of course important. But going from where we are to zero, of course, needs to, uh, to happen by changing the fuel to something that doesn't emit uh, CO2. Um, and in uh, this year, we, uh, we Change the deadline to 2040. So now we are even more in a hurry than when than we were last year. Um, all the new ships that we will buy in Maersk has to be uh, carbon neutral, or they have to to be able to sail on a carbon neutral fuel. Uh, and what is that? Uh, I'll tell you about that in a moment. But uh, but uh, anyway, we're not going to buy the same kinds of ships that we already did uh, in the past. Um, so shipping in general is, is clearly a part of the, the climate problem. Uh, the amount of uh, fuel consumed in the shipping sector is more than uh, 300 million tons of fuel oil per year, which uh, corresponds to almost 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. For Maersk alone, uh, the fuel consumption is 11 million tons of fuel per year, uh, and that corresponds to 0.1%. And um, you could say that from the 740 different container vessels that we operate, uh, we need to, to, to change a lot of fuel uh, to, to, to reach our target. Um, but technologies are available and we believe that we should just get started and get some learnings and, and get on the way to, to, to zero. So who can use the biomass in the world? That's a very good question and we are not able to answer that. Also, how much biomass is available? We also don't know that. But uh, on this slide, I, I stole a figure from uh, the Biofuture campaign, and they collected a number of different studies. Uh, and you can see the, the amount of, of available bioenergy from these studies uh, changed between 28 and 287 exajoules uh, per year in uh, 2050. And if you take just the simple average of that, uh, the number is 112 exajoules uh, plus a, a big standard deviation. 
Um, and if you uh, compare that to, to the amount of fuel used uh, by shipping sector and by Maersk, you can see that the entire biomass that is sustainably available um, will, will be uh, will be, be corresponding to 11 percent being uh, being needed by the shipping sector to to decarbonize completely. And for Maersk alone, we would need 0.4 percent of all the biomass available. So that that means that 250 times our company size would need all the biomass, and we don't think that's that that's possible in the long term. So so in the long term, we believe that we also need electrofuels. But uh, biofuels is, is uh, the fastest way to get started on decarbonization. So um, the chicken and the egg dilemma you, you often hear about in the, in the, in the discussions on, on decarbonization. So who wants to build a, a ship that, uh, that doesn't have any uh, fuel available, uh, green fuel? And who wants to start producing these fuels if there are no off-takers for these fuels? And in most, we, we just started uh, challenging this by, by buying some ships that will need quite a lot of uh, green uh, methanol, uh, being a new uh, kind of fuel. And, and these ships will be delivered from 24 to 25, so quite, quite soon. And already next year, we'll have a small vessel, a feeder vessel, oh, uh, that will need uh, 10,000 tons of uh, green methanol per year. And we did uh, uh, succeed to, to source that from uh, e-methanol being produced from biogas CO2 here in Denmark, and that will come online next year. Um, also, we uh, engaged in a number of strategic partnerships to, to source green methanol. These are not uh, firm contracts yet, but we believe that, uh, that they will succeed. And, and if, if all goes as planned with these partners, we will have enough uh, green methanol for, for the 12 container vessels that we have bought already. But we need uh, much more fuel than that. And uh, I think the, the, ma the main uh, takeaway from this slide is that the methanol that we are, we are sourcing now or trying to source, that's, that's a mixture of biomethanol, uh, and I'll come back to the process for that, and e-methanol produced from CO2 and hydrogen. This slide shows a number of different uh, fuel options that you can uh, use for, for shipping, and they all need uh, new ships. And uh, these, uh, I call them uh, one molecule fuels. So that's simple chemicals that can be used as a fuel. And the, the other part of the, the figure is uh, different alcohols, methanol being the most important one. And I highlighted that with two different colors because you can, you can source it as biomethanol and e-methanol. And then uh, ethanol uh, can, from fermentation can potentially also be used in the same engines. And in the middle, I've uh, shown the higher alcohols. We have uh, invested in a company, Prometheus Fuels, that can produce a process that uh, like that offer process that can produce uh, higher alcohols from C3 and up uh, by direct air capture and uh, electrification of that process. Uh, in the lower part of the figure, you can see uh, different uh, gases, uh, methane being one and uh, DME, hydrogen and ammonia being other ones. And we believe that uh, the low ones, DME, hydrogen and ammonia could potentially have a role to play in the future. While uh, methane we think is not a suitable fuel for, for our ships due to methane slip uh, issues and due to uh, energy losses when you produce e-methane. Um, on this slide, you can see the fuels that we already use today as biofuels. We have the service called Merced Eco Delivery, where the, the clients can pay a premium and then get green shipping already ready today. And that's based on the FAME and HVO. And I guess that's the same uh, fuels that uh, Philippe just uh, uh, told you about in the last presentation. And these are very good fuels, uh, as well as what I've heard, but we believe that it's not scalable to, 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 uh, to source uh, this kind of fuel for all, all shipping. So we're looking at different alternatives to drop in, in, in the existing ships. And pyrolysis and HCL fuels, as we'll hear about from BGG, that's uh, one very promising pathway we believe that, that can be cheap and, uh, and, and possible to use for, for shipping. Other fuels are fish drops based and this alcohol to heavy oils, that they are very high quality fuels, but we believe they will be uh, mainly used by aviation because it will be a high value product. So, so producing these for marine applications, we don't think will, will fly. Uh, in the very low, uh, in the bottom, you can see uh, a fuel called lignin alcohol. That's something that we try to develop ourselves. So the lignin, when you do second generation uh, ethanol, uh, can be actually uh, dissolved into alcohols and that could potentially be used in the same ships that we buy uh, now for alcohols. On this slide, I tried to show just the same as the two previous slides. If you go from biomass to these new ships, uh, you can go by gasification, anaerobic digestion and fermentation. 
the fuels will be from these three processes, methanol, biogas, and bioethanol. Uh, the biogas we don't see as a fuel, so we'll put, the, put that into a reformer and put it into a methanol synthesis and then also produce biomethanol from that. Uh, and also uh, e-fuels from CO2 and hydrogen will also go into new ships, we believe. Uh, lignin uh, can be dissolved into ethanol and, and also be used in these ships. But for the, the existing ships, uh, which is for us more than 700 vessels, uh, we need some drop-in fuels and those could be produced from uh, fish and shrubs uh, on, from a gasifier. But we, we think that that's not a suitable solution because part of the product will be lost to, to other fractions that cannot be used as a shipping fuel, for example, gasoline and wax. Uh, and, and the product that you actually do produce will be of too high value for shipping. Um, paralysis in HCL, we think that's a good way to go. But we also believe that we need some upgrading because the, the fuels are not uh, very stable. They contain a lot of oxygen and uh, they will have a high acidity and so on. And we believe that a mild upgrading uh, using hydrogen would be needed. But that's something we're trying to, to learn how to do now. Uh, from all the, all the pathways, you will have an excess of carbon because you don't have enough hydrogen. And that will come out as biochar or CO2. And these uh, will also be value fractions. We believe that all the carbon from biomass should be utilized in the future. So what is pyrolysis? In principle, it's uh, very simple. It's just a decomposition brought about by high temperatures. In the, in the absence of, uh, of oxidant, no, no uh, oxygen or air uh, in the process. Uh, and that's very simple. You just heat up your biomass and it decomposes into to an oil. But it's also very complicated because uh, the oxygen will stay in this oil and you will also have some, uh, some byproducts uh, of, of quite a lot of uh, importance because it's a big fraction of the biomass going that way. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's possible. It's already being done for heating oil uh, for different companies. Um, and um, we believe that it's also possible for shipping with a mild upgrading. We think it's very difficult to go to jet fuel from pyrolysis oil. So that's actually an opportunity for, for the shipping sector. And uh, in the shipping sector, we are, we're used to very bad fuels because heavy fuel oil, that's just a residual of uh, fossil oil uh, uh, fuel production. Um, and uh, the HFO, it's, it's very viscous fuel and it has impurities and it has a lot of aromats and acidity. And we know how to handle that in, in Maersk, and we know that how to handle that in the shipping sector. And we have very few requirements for the, for the fuel. Actually, the engine can, can burn almost everything that comes into it. And these requirements are mainly dictated by handling the fuel before combustion. Uh, but the flash point uh, being above 60 degrees is very important because if we don't have that, the, the ship is not uh, insured, um, and that, that, that's, not a, that's not good. Uh, the stability needs to be okay. We cannot have a fuel that uh, forms a gum uh, in, in the tank of the ship. So we need at least nine months or more, maybe more than one year of stability. Uh, miscibility, if it's a drop-in fuel, we need the fuel to be miscible with the heavy fuel oil. And then the poor point, the viscosity cannot be so high that we cannot bunker the fuel. So these fuels, if you add hydrogen, then you improve the quality by removing the oxygen. And you can see uh, to the left here, the, the cons of doing that uh, hydrogen is costly. So it's, uh, it adds cost to the fuel. And also the process is quite complicated. It's technically dif difficult and uh, it will add cost to, to the fuel uh, production. Uh, and the catalyst lifetime of this process might be quite low uh, due, to all, due to all the oxygen and impurities. But uh, on the pro side, you can say more hydrogen will give higher quality. And uh, also more hydrogen will give you more energy per CO2 emitted from the ship. And that's, that might be very important in the future. So the right, you can see the chemical composition from some typical pyrolysis oil. And uh, adding hydrogen will just uh, move this composition in this diagram. And what we're trying to learn now is how, how long should this arrow be? How much do we need to improve to get a, an OK marine fuel? Uh, the last slide, uh, second last slide here, uh, if you see uh, pr production of green methanol as a black box, you can have three inputs, biomass, hydrogen, and uh, CO2, and that cannot be fossil CO2. Um, and um, if, if, you, if you go from biomass, the, the amount of hydrogen you need to completely utilize the, the, the carbon is much, much lower than going from CO2, uh, meaning producing electric fuel. Uh, typically, it's, it's at least four times lower than, than for e-fuels. And uh, renewable power will be a limitation, so that's, that's quite important. Um, and also, I mean, you, you can 
convert biomass by gasification or by reforming of biogas um, completely without adding hydrogen, but then you would uh, uh, bend some CO2 from the process. So the, the biofuels will have the, the pro of being a cheaper uh, pathway to, to, to fuel production, and it will have the, the, the large con of, um, of uh, depending on biomass, That's, uh, that, that will be a challenge in the future. And um, also um, for the e-fuels, um, can you still see my slide? Yes. Okay, because I think I have a small problem here. Um, the e-fuels will be, uh, I mean, independent of biomass, but it will depend on, on, uh, on CO2 that cannot be fossil. And in, in the long run, we believe that the CO2 will have to come from the air. Uh, one third option, uh, I cannot change slides now. Oh, here. Okay, um, you could produce hydrogen without uh, carbon and uh, ammonia without carbon, and that could be a great fuel, but we don't see how to use the hydrogen because it's too difficult to store for large container vessels and the ammonia, we don't see a ready solution that yet. And that's mainly due to, uh, to safety of the, of the handling of the fuel because it's a toxic uh, chemical. And also the engine is not ready yet. There's no commercial engine available. And uh, for, for ammonia, also the issue about laughter gas production um, will have to be solved before, uh, before we can start using this fuel. So last slide summary, we'll need a lot of fuel. Uh, we, we need the green fuels in the future. Uh, if we can get our hands on biomass, it will be a faster way to, to decarbonization. That would be, you could say our preferred feedstock, uh, but we think that uh, there will be a limitation to how much biomass we can use. Uh, if we cannot do that, we will have to produce e-fuels and that will uh, depend on the availability of renewable power. Um, some, some rough numbers, if Maersk uh, needs to go completely for e-fuel um, to, to decarbonize the fleet now, we would need something like 220 terawatt hours. That's almost half the, the power production of uh, France or seven times the power production of uh, Denmark. So that's quite a lot of power. Uh, we can use a number of fuels and we believe that we will uh, need different fuels. Um, for the new ships, methanol, ethanol, uh, lignin alcohols could, could be uh, good fuels. For new ships, uh, and these ships will also need a pilot fuel. You cannot run entirely on, on alcohol. So 5% of volume of, uh, of some uh, drop-in, uh, some oil-based fuel that could be uh, fossil diesel, but it could also be a biofuel. Um, then the blending uh, with the, the fuel oils we have uh, will be important to decarbonize the ships we have, and we believe that pyrolysis and hydrothermal liquefaction will be a pathway to that. And we're also open to, to new possibilities, and we see a lot happening in this space right now. So, uh, so we want to go into dialogue with any fuel producers that has good uh, technology to offer. And then I think that's it. If I can yeah, change the last slide. Here's my email address. Please reach out if you, you want to, to discuss with us uh, after this event. And uh, we're also um, um, participating in a, a number of uh, conferences and so on. And pre please reach out to us or, uh, at any time. Thank you very much. Jakob, many, many thanks. Um, um, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, just a quick, I, I missed that. Why, why do you need 5% of oil-based fuel if you use alcohols? So, um, I mean, uh, in a, I'm not an expert in diesel engines, but uh, alcohols cannot be compressed to ignition. So you uh, need something that starts, that starts, that starts uh, the combustion Starting. in the engine. And, uh, and the way you do that is to have a different flame in the engine that is, that is uh, fed with a different fuel. And that would be, I think, for a start, marine uh, marine diesel, but it could easily be pyrolysis oil uh, or also uh, HVO yeah, yeah. or flame uh, in the future. Um, but but uh, it could also be, uh, I mean, DME, which is a derivative of uh, methanol. You could produce that, and that would be an excellent uh, pilot fuel. And uh, potentially, you could also have a mixture of alcohol and something else that would uh, allow this uh, ignition to happen. But it, roughly 5%, uh, the same is needed for methane. If you go for LNG, you need a pilot fuel as well. And that's maybe one or 2% of the volume or, or of the energy. And uh, for ammonia, we don't know the, the need for pilot fuel yet because the engine has not been produced, but it will most likely be a lot higher, maybe 20%. So that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jakob. And while I have the mic, uh, I have a second quick question. 
when you were mentioning your eco delivery um, services, just to get an idea, how much more expensive are those uh, just in percentage? Um, I, I actually don't know at all. Uh, okay. I, I don't know. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's significant. And uh, I know that we have uh, customers that, that are ready to pay for that. But um, I don't know the numbers and I don't know okay, if I can okay. save the numbers. It's just out of interest, no? Because obviously 1% is fine, 10 is much, you know, or, or uh, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I don't know. Sorry. Um, so uh, any other questions? I think, again, John, uh, nothing from the chat, but, uh... but, but... But I think I can add to that. I mean, we have some clients that, that pay for this equal delivery now, uh, and that's a solution we have ready now. But many of these clients also set targets targets for their decarbonization that includes uh, mm -hmm. uh, scope three emissions. And that means that they, they need to, to have a, a climate neutral shipping solution also in the future. And, and th that, that gives us, I mean, comfort that going for, for completely uh, decarbonization of the fleet uh, is a way to go uh, for us because some of the clients need it. And I think uh, the, the premium for that will have to be shared by, by, by the sector and, and the customers. Yeah, yeah. My, my experience is mainly from the aviation sector where since many years the, the burden sharing of the extra costs of the fuels is being discussed there. Eh? You're you, you will have the same, eh? so Patrick, it's your your floor. <laughs> yeah, thank you for a, a very interesting uh, presentation, which uh, con uh, yeah, really you told a lot uh, while it was still very followable. Um, may I ask you about this uh, ammonia fuel? Uh, you you mentioned shortly that it could lead to laughter gas, so mm -hmm. NO two. Um, it might also lead to. Uh, N2O, sorry, uh, it might also lead to uh, to NOx mm -hmm. and the uh, um, um, a, a, a pollutant. Do, it, it will it will lead to a lot of NOx. Uh, uh -huh. that, that's not a question. It it will do that, but but you can remove the NOx. Okay, so so you um, foresee ships with uh, denox installations, really? Yes. Yes. Okay. I mean, if, if that is the fuel of the future, you, you would need a Dinox installation on board the ship. Okay, wow. Um, and then another one. Uh, you mentioned uh, you have 700 existing ships and, yep. and um, about 11 new ones. Huh? Um, now, many of us are not so in the shipping business. Um, how soon, how, what is your turnaround ratio for all your ships? Uh, will these 700 chips be around for the next uh, 28 years or uh, will you replace them very regularly and you could say well by 2050 i have a fully modern fleet and all the old ships are gone yeah uh, i'm not sure we know the answer to that question uh, yet i mean we, we know our targets and we know that there are two different a uh, number of different uh, pathways to go I mean, energy efficiency, improving that uh, will also play a part uh, in the future, of course. Uh, but, but the methanol ships will, will be one way to go and improving the, uh, increasing the number of ships from these, it's a 12 plus a half a, a ship, 12 and a small one. Uh, increasing that to a larger number will, will, uh, will add to this uh, effort, but also uh, getting some drop-in fuels will do that. And we don't know uh, how, how much will do one uh, kind of uh, initiative and how much the other. Uh, but I, I think that we need a solution for some of the existing vessels, but that could also be rebuilding for methanol. And we are looking into that now. I, I don't think we can share anything on this yet. Okay. Good. Thank you very but, much. But, but, but I mean, uh, replacing an oil-fueled vessel with an uh, alcohol-fueled vessel is, is not straightforward because you need a different engine and you need, because of the low flashpoint of the alcohol, you need to re rearrange everything in the ship that is related to the fuel handling, because you need an extra layer of, uh, of safety around the, the fuel, because the vapor pressure is so high that you can ignite it at normal temperatures. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, thanks again, uh, uh, Jacob. Uh, Thank you. Excellent presentation. So uh, with this, I would like to invite our next speaker, Patrick Rogerman, senior consultant from uh, BTG, Biomass Technology Group. We heard already, you know, some hopes are on your side for the production of this pyrolysis oil. 
Um, uh, this is what Patrick will talk about. Pyrolysis oil production and upgrading to renewable marine biofuels. Uh, um, yes, Patrick, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, try to share my screen. Please tell me if it's okay. You did much better than I did. <laughs> for, for now, for now. Maybe. It's okay, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Reiner. Thank you uh, uh, for this introduction. Uh, um, um, and uh, I'm uh, going to tell you about uh, work we did in the framework of the music project. Uh, it's about indeed the uh, production upgrading to renewable marine uh, fuels. Uh, uh, I am Patrick Reinerman from BTG and uh, we work together uh, on this work also with good fuels. So uh, yeah, the lines are as always uh, short. Um, it's about, the music project is about intermediate bioenergy carriers. I will not tell a lot more about it because John already told about it, but we focus of course on this pyrolysis oil, which is one of the uh, intermediate bioenergy carriers. And uh, what we did, we looked at the value chain from the production to the upgrading of to marine biofuels in the Netherlands. And we did it on paper, so, so not, not in reality, um, sadly, but we, we believe that this is also necessary to do to know what is needed to develop such a value chain. Uh, first, something about the pyrolysis process. Um, uh, Jacob uh, already told a little bit about it. What you do is you take biomass, and that can be um, various types of biomass, but often it is wood. You heat that shortly without oxygen, and uh, you can get, uh, you uh, condensate the vapors, and then you get an oil, a liquid, liquid type uh, uh, fluid. It's actually not an oil. Um, well, and this process, uh, uh, th this works. Uh, we have demonstrated this at uh, full scale and have now implemented three plants, three 24,000 tons per year production plants for produ producing this oil. Uh, this is a picture of the first plant in the Netherlands, which operates since, since 2015. And in the later years, we have implemented one in uh, uh, Sweden and one in Finland. And again, as Jacob said, the upgrading of the oil is required to produce uh, stable oils. You can use pyrolysis oil for energy, but you can, of course, also do other things with it and um, make uh, heat and electricity as a relatively low value product, but also other bio-based products, especially if you fractionate the oil into various fractions. Uh, we, we are working on foam resins, we're working on uh, molding materials. We can use it as a material to modify wood. Um, and for now, however, we go for transport fuels yeah, because for there, we think that there is a market and uh, yeah, quite some quantities are needed there. At the rationale, what we took in into our project is that we want to produce pyrolysis oil in places where there's a lot of biomass. And then because pyrolysis oil can relatively easily be transported, you do it, you print, go bring it to the market where the transportation fuels are needed. We look at the entire value chain. So from the residues to the production, to the transport, to the upgrading. Um, in our case study, we looked at uh, implementing pyrolysis plants in Sweden and Finland. Yeah, there is quite some biomass there. And putting it on a ship, for international transport, bringing it to Rotterdam, and then upgrading it into one, um, uh, in one upgrading plant. And we looked in two case studies for it. In one case studies, we, we study, we looked at the minimum quantity which would be needed for such an upgrading plant. And in a, another study, a follow-up, we looked at a bigger plant which would be more economically optimal. At least that was the idea. 
for the production of the pyrolysis oil, we looked at the feedstock, both in Finland and both in Sweden. And uh, we did location searches based on the availability of residues. We made these types of graphs where we put the total cost of getting the feedstock versus the amount of um, had this is cost and this is the amount of uh, material you need and obviously it's a it's a line huh? if you uh, need more then it costs more but at some points you have to stop and that was what determined the quantities that we needed and it turned out that um, there is in the baltics of in the nordic countries there is existing markets uh, with these quantities you um you 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 enter those markets and that has an effect we expect on price availability uh, so you cannot just say okay we have huge amounts um we can get as much as we want no that's not the way um we looked at the harbors uh, you saw the harbors that we could uh use for the transport and we also looked at other things like logistics uh, it, it, it's adv quite advantageous to uh, locate the paralysis plants in pairs to share facilities financial feasibility was determined uh, costs for the oil are 350 to 400 euros uh, dependent on how profitable you want to be uh, for this specific application case and then you can transport it uh, we looked at three ports Skelleftea and Skutskar in Sweden, which are relatively close to the um, uh, good locations for the pyrolysis plant, and Kokkola in Finland. Um, good fuels looked at uh, several ways of transporting. Now you could think of um, a hub, uh, somewhere a hub in the south of Sweden, putting it every, uh, bringing everything there and then do the international transport, or have just one ship do a port to port and then pick everything up. Um, river transport was also uh, looked after. That turned out to be a bit more difficult. Uh, we looked at ship size, uh, big ships, small ships, uh, etc. Uh, the, the, um, um, the end result was that uh, it's best to have a port to port transport. So actually, quite a standard way of transporting this material. Um, costs are around 60 euros per ton for a 24 day interval. And of course you have costs for uh, storage at the ports in Sweden and Finland, and you have to store the oil here before you can use it. We took that all in. Then the upgrading to marine biofuels uh, as said, Pyrolysis oil is quite reactive and you need to change the composition to make it more stable and uh, uh, better usable in uh, marine engines. Uh, um, there are several ways to do this. You can just put the pyrolysis oil in a oil refinery. This happens currently uh, at the Prim refinery in Sweden, where uh, pyrolysis oil is currently being upgraded to transport fuels. You can also give the pyrolysis oil a mild pretreatment and then put it in a refinery. Then you can put more in. Yeah, for the raw pyrolysis oil, you're limited to around 5% of your, your intake of your, your oil there. Um, you can also go on and um, use more hydrogen to make hydrogenated pyrolysis oil, HPO, and then you have actually directly um, marine or, or you have transportation fuels, which you can use for marine applications. How do you do that? Well, it's a standalone process. I'm not, you can, uh, you have the, 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 uh, the refinery process and you have the standalone process. And we're now talking about the standalone process that we want to develop further. Um, and what you do is you have this oil. This oil, you put it in a two-step process where under relatively um, uh, under pressure, you bring it with a catalyst and with hydrogen. Um, you get more hydrogen in, the, in the, the, the system and your 
uh, you remove some of the oxygen. Uh, again, Jacob showed it in his uh, graphs, what happens then, huh? you get more oxygen, less hydrogen, so your energy content gets higher. Um, then you get this, uh, here you see some of the uh, composition of the uh, various uh, liquids. Uh, here you see the pyrolysis oil, uh, it has still quite some water, it has a relatively low energy density, um, it's quite acidic, and yeah, flashpoint is difficult to determine even. After that, after you've hydro treated it, then the water is practically removed. Your LHV, your lower heating value is a lot of higher. You have got rid of your acidity. Your sulfur is even, lo even lower. The only point I saw just net is the flush point is not exactly what it should be, but we are quite close yeah, yet to something which can be used for the uh, uh, shipping sector. We did a technological, uh, techno-economic evaluation. Um, there we saw that uh, the, the, the cost for transport fuels, these biotransport fuels are roughly twice that of current fuels. And we know that the current uh, shipping fuels have increased quite in price, but also the costs of making the biofuels have increased as well. Uh, um, it, uh, hydrogen, is an important part of the costs. And um, yeah, it is uh, uh, quite important that this hydrogen needs to be sustainable because uh, yeah, quite some of the energy of the project comes from the hydrogen. You need some hydrogen. If your hydrogen is not sustainable, your product is not sustainable. So this is really a key for um, um, making your product uh, suitable for the market. Um, I should now notice uh, that we are pr producing this project uh, for th this process now on a pilot scale, and uh, it is not demonstrated yet. We are planning for a demonstration plant uh, to be implemented soon uh, in uh, one or two years, but it has not happened yet. So there are significant uncertainties in this techno-economic evaluation. We also looked at this hydrogen in more detail. I know this is a bit complicated slide, but uh, allow me to point you to the things which are important here. And what, I, what we wanted to do is to check, uh, does it make sense to use sustainable hydrogen or is it okay to use gray hydrogen? And we looked at the cost and the cost per ton of CO2 for fully green hydrogen. In this case, we have electrolysis hydrogen, a mix of green and gray, half electrolysis hydrogen and half from natural gas, and some with, with CO2 capture, the, 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 uh, uh, I believe it's called blue hydrogen, and fully gray hydrogen. And first, what you saw was that uh, the emission saving percentage, even of the fully gray hydrogen, were 65%, which would be just enough for the, the um, um, EU regulations on CO2 emission reduction, but only just, it's, it's really scraping by with a, what do you say, with just sufficient, eh? it's, it's not, not great. If you go for fully green, your emission savings percentage are far, uh, far higher, of course. Then we took literature values of the expected costs of the green and the gray hydrogen, yeah, and it should be noted that if you look at literature, you can find wild changes in these wildly varying costs of hydrogen yeah, from the very optimistic to the very pessimistic. Um, we looked at the price difference and the cost per ton of CO2. And what you see here is that if you use greener hydrogen, your cost per ton of CO2 go down, even though the hydrogen is more expensive. So this shows that it makes quite a lot of sense to use sustainable hydrogen for this type of um, um, biofuels. Some final observations. Um, we saw that the value chain uh, looks technical vi viable, apart from the upgrading, which is at the moment at TRL five to six. Uh, there are no 
showstoppers were identified. There are quite some costs for transport, but it is within limits. It's like 20% of the total costs for the feedstock. Um, a higher design capacity did not lead to significant lower transport fuel costs. And that's mostly due to the price increases between our first study and our second. In a year, transport fuel price, transport prices have increased substantially. Um, and yeah, of course, um, we have to do additional damage scale up um, activities and the sourcing and production of hydrogen, the sustainable sourcing of hydrogen is very important for both the economy and for sustainability uh, uh, reasons. Thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, I would like to give the word back to uh, um, Reiner. Uh, yeah, many, many thanks, uh, Patrick. Very nice presentation. Though obviously I've I've seen it before, yeah, you know, <laughs> but it's still yeah. it's still uh, it's still a good one. Eh? And it very nicely um, presents the activities that are done uh, within the, the, the music project. Uh, but in addition, also you highlighted actually the BTG's activities towards uh, demonstrating this upgrading of pyrolysis all to make it feasible as a um, as a fuel for the maritime sector. Just a quick question from my side: Do you believe this sixty-five percent uh, uh, threshold or uh, for um, hydrogen from natural gas? This is probably with a reason, eh? not to block the uh, the natural gas uh, as a as potential supplier. Uh, of fuels, no. Uh, usually, these regulations they put the thre thresholds with a with a reason. Eh? Um, I, I'm not sure if that is really uh, connected in in one way. It is really a, co quite a coincidence that 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 with the calculations we came at 65 percent. Uh, it's from the red two, so mm -hmm. uh, it is probably a little bit outdated. It may increase in in the future. Uh, so uh, I, I think. It, it would be unwise to 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 put everything on that limit. Um, and the other thing is that um, the uh, CO two emission reduction. Hey, you can um, tweak that with your hydrogen, which can be more or less sustainable. But there are also other ways to do that. Hey, if you do carbon capture and storage uh, of carbon capture at your pyrolysis plants, you can also decrease the CO two emissions. Um, so, so I, I wouldn't read too much about uh, on this exact sixty-five percent we got with the gray hydrogen. Uh, my my idea is is my expectation. It's not more than that, but an expectation is that a uh, full-scale plant will will use sustainable hydrogen. I think um, that is uh, certainly a first demo lighthouse project will want to be a sustainable project. So you want to use sustainable hydrogen and of course, on hydrogen, there are many, many, many developments which, um, yeah, will likely lead to price reductions. So in the end, it, it will not be; it will be a no-brainer, I think. Okay, thanks a lot, Patrick. Uh, Jakob, okay. you raised your hand, and we also would welcome back uh, Maria. It's good that you could make it. Thank you for a good presentation, Patrick. Uh, regarding scaling of your technology, uh, I think it's interesting to hear. What, what is your take on the main limitations of scaling uh, one side production of pyrolysis oil? Is it the feedstock uh, transportation or is it uh, the, the size of the plant itself? Uh, and I think it also relates to the issue on hydrogen. And I think it was a nice, nice study you presented with the gray and green hydrogen. Uh, the, the way I see forward for hydrogen for pyrolysis upgrade uh, short term would be to take the, the light end of the, of the fractions you get out of the, the process and crack that into hydrogen. And it, it also relates to the flash point you showed that was quite low for your, for your fuel. If you, if you take out more light ends, then you can increase the flash point and get more light ends to produce hydrogen that can be used on site. But, but it all comes down to scaling and, uh, and designing of, yeah. uh, of, a, of, of a good uh, layout uh, in one side. And the hydrogen is difficult to move, so, so it has to be in one side. Uh, if you can comment on, on the scaling uh, in general on hydrogen from, from cracking of light ends also. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, um, I believe there, there were quite some questions uh, uh, layered into what you, what you said. Uh, I, I hope I, I, I take all of them. 
uh, the first one is about the uh, the scaling issue. Had the uh, pyrolysis production, the production of pyrolysis oil requires as feedstock biomass, and there you have a scaling issue. Is it's it's limited uh, by the logistics of the biomass. Uh, it's of course also limited to the technology. Uh, the the, the uh, BDG technology is available in one size. Uh, it's, it's like a T Ford. Uh, you can um you can get any t ford as long as it's black as as uh, the, the owner said a uh, long time ago have we have one size uh, but but that is simply because um making more sizes is technically possible but but in practice not not economical now um so the for the production of pyrolysis oil the limit is the feedstock then if you have pyrolysis oil you can transport that relatively easy to an upgrading plant and for the upgrading plant the scaling issue is is not not really present it is a um, chemical process using liquids using hydrogen uh, under pressure so um, th that can be scaled to 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 quite high uh, you locate it likely in the place where you have a lot of hydrogen because you know your pyrolysis all can be transported quite easily your hydrogen may be less so, so you put it in a place where you have hydrogen, then you can go as high as possible. Um, then about uh, using the light ends or the heavy ends, um, yeah, I think that will require more study and more uh, more work. How we uh, produce in our hydrogenated pyrolysis oil a wide boiling range, if you can say, yeah, so. Uh, you have to, via separation techniques, such as distillations, you have to separate light ends, heavy ends, etc. And that will depend on, on the market and what you can find. Uh, um, I could find the think of a situation where the, the heavier parts are used for marine, the lighter parts are used for other things, uh, maybe maybe soft. Uh, that's, uh, I, I, uh, we think that there are also opportunities for that. Uh, but that is simply... That is simply a thing which needs to be worked out further. We know that it's technically possible to distill the right amounts on a laboratory scale, but we don't know yet how that works out in practice. You know, we are in the demonstration phase and um, uh, to, to demonstrate this technology that requires quite some efforts and will yield also a lot of new information on especially these ways eh, on how you apply uh, your technology what mix you make and what markets you serve i Thank hope you. i got I got everything with yeah that. i think you got everything uh, and maybe a follow-up question to the, the the feedstock sourcing i mean uh, if you were to design one site for fuel production including upgrading and everything uh, you, you would have to source more feedstock but uh, the country i live in uh, denmark we we ship a lot of uh, wood pellets from the us to europe so, I mean, it can be done if regulation allows. So uh, we, we actually source millions of tons of wood pellets from the US. And maybe that's a question to Maria, uh, coming back to the discussion here. Uh, would that be possible uh, in regulation to allow uh, transportation of wood pellets for fuel production? Um, for the moment, uh, I, don't, I don't see uh, a constraint but sustainability criteria that are under the red two. Uh, and there it says that the transfer of fuels have to be those that are described in Annex 9 of um, uh, the red two and the, the recast. So there it is basically waste, ligrocellulosic type uh, waste, uh, waste and, and residues. Now, if someone can show that these uh, pellets are produced from this type of ligrocellulosic uh, waste and uh, residues, and they are certified and it can be accepted, I don't see um, the constraint. So for, for what you need to have in uh, your mind is that uh, we support uh, advanced biofuels, no matter what is the use. If either these are bioliquids or biomass fuels, they should be advanced. And the advance now uh, includes the sustainability criteria of uh, the uh, production of the feature. So uh, as long as these are uh, 
But maybe, maybe as a follow-up, Maria, I... Ours, to allow it is for subsidies, right? Because mm -hmm. I'll get subsidies. So it is possible, as I heard. Yeah, yeah. On but the then, conditions that I described. Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, Maria, but I, I believe the issue is that uh, quite a lot of these wood pellets from Southeast US, they are made from, from round wood, no? Or so this that's the what, issue. Eh? Yeah. This is what I said, uh, actually. Yeah. Uh, Renier, that uh, if they do not uh, fulfill this sustainability criteria, yeah, they will yeah. not be allowed for subsidies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no, I just wanted to clarify that most of these pellets that are coming around would not qualify. Eh? This, yeah. uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, good. No, uh, again, Maria, uh, welcome back. And I think we have already started um, uh, discussing. This is, uh, this is very good. Uh, John, if you agree, we have about uh, uh, a bit less than 15 minutes. We will just keep the ball rolling and not have a, a, a long uh, um, uh, closing. Eh? I will just give you the word then for two or three minutes in the end. Is yeah. that fine? May, yeah, well, just one uh, intervention. There was a question in the chat yes. whilst uh, Patrick was presenting. You see, you see it? I see it, yes. And uh, okay. actually, I, I did want to, to um, add, and it's actually it's a question to, uh, to Jakob uh, by Frederick uh, yeah, to cross, or if we have it's French, then it's differently, but I can't, sorry. So different fuels means different engines. Are you ready to have a fleet with very different engines uh, in bracket fuel cells, combust combustion, and so on? I'm not quite sure whether you mentioned fuel cells, eh? but I, I think the, the, the question is clear. Obviously, it's easier to have one engine only. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure I can give a good answer, but, uh, but, but I think the, the, the answer is yes, uh, we are ready for that. Uh, and I mean, uh, we, we are already getting into that, buying new ships uh, that are going to run on alcohols while we still have the old ships. And I think also uh, taking this discussion further on the long run, we, we are also seeing fuel cells on large container vessels as, as an option uh, if they get scaled uh, to megawatt size uh, or, or you could say 50 megawatt size. If you can get that on a fuel cell, that could be the main propulsion of the ship. And then the, the chemical fuels will be very important. I mean, all the fuels produced from hydrogen can be converted back into hydrogen on board the ship and used on a fuel cell. Uh, and that, that would also allow for ammonia to be used uh, with, I think, less concern from our side because putting ammonia into an engine with a large moving parts, that's uh, quite difficult because it's difficult to get a, a completely uh, tight engine. Uh, and having a cracker that just cracks ammonia to hydrogen on board that would, uh, that would basically take out the engine boom from the ship and just uh, reduce the conversion of ammonia to a tank of ammonia and a small uh, cracker unit that will produce hydrogen on board. Uh, and that would introduce a third kind of uh, engine, you could say electrically driven ships. But if, if we need more than that, I think that's also possible. But of course, we would prefer to have one engine being the perfect engine uh, in the end. But for now, that's not our limitation. We, we are open to, to any changes to, to, to get moving. Yeah, yeah, but not, not a different engine for all of the 700, I assume. No, no, no. As, yeah, few no. As, as few as possible. So actually, we have a second comment by Ignacio uh, um, Figoli. And uh, he's basically uh, underlining that uh, uh, sawdust from sawmills are the lowest feedstock uh, have the lowest feedstock price to achieve, achieve um, uh, green methanol. Right? Or obviously, I, I think also, uh, Patrick, your feedstock was, uh, was sawdust. So certainly that is a feedstock that is, uh, is uh, looked at and it uh, will serve to, to join uh, forestry and energy policies. Yeah? So this, uh, I believe the comment is, is correct. Yeah? Um, uh, was that for me? Because uh, I don't uh, agree completely. I mean, we're also going into projects producing uh, methanol from uh, uh, MSW, municipality solid waste, and uh, that could be by gasification uh, as we as we try with the company waste fuel in the US. And I think that's a cheaper feedstock than the, the than sawdust, to be honest. Um. Uh, yes, even below zero sometimes, eh? If you're if you're good, <laughs> okay. Um, so the also has another market, the panels. Yeah, and, and maybe also I can add that um, for now we use these wood residues like sawdust because they are the easiest fuel. Uh, they are 
um, uh, lower quality biomass fuels can also be used for pyrolysis, but you need a little bit more pretreatment. It, it's not now happening if there is sawdust, huh, because that's the easiest thing, but it's not that it will never work with other things. Yes, Seb, uh, thank you. Actually, um, so we, we, we have already entered the, the roundtable discussion, so <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks again to all. Um, I had um, uh, shared beforehand a number of guiding questions. Obviously, these are too many now for the remaining five minutes, but still, I, I would uh, like to, uh, to touch the topics of policies and the uh, research. And uh, with respect to, uh, to policies, um, so I will just read the four bullets and then maybe uh, each of our um, uh, three industry representatives could very briefly uh, specify the, the, the wishes and suggestions. So what are the views of the industry representatives on, on the effectiveness of the current uh, EU and global policies uh, for the marine sector? Will these uh, serve to establish a market for sustainable maritime fuels and lead to decarbonization of the sector? Which elements are missing uh, and are there any further recommendations? Um, again, like it would be about one minute uh, each. Jakob, would you want to start? I think one of the issues you already addressed uh, before, you know. But... So I, ha I have a question from Ria before on, on the ETS system uh, and how to expand that to the rest of the world. I think that's a, a big challenge in the future, how that will play out. Uh, what what uh, Maersk has tried to, to push the IMO to do is to, to, to introduce a a flat carbon tax for all the industry of 150 US dollars per ton of CO2 equivalent. And, and I think that would that would be our biggest wish to, to, to have that flying. Uh, but but while that is not possible, I, I think the, the, the approach from the European Commission is the right one so far, uh, pushing in a number of different ways to get started. And I think actually uh, on the technology side, just getting started, however you do that, uh, if it's just by um, introducing biofuels uh, in a European context to get the learnings, and then wh when you see that, that this pathway is possible, you, you can start to push the world more to, to adopt to the same policies. That, I think that, that, that's also a, a possibility. But, but the preference from us would be to, to have a flat carbon tax. So uh, our CEO uh, said uh, quite provocative uh, recently that uh, we could ban fossil fuels in in maritime sector in 2035, uh, and I'm not sure that I don't think that will happen, and I'm not sure we'll be ready for that. <laughs> but but uh, but I mean, trying to 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 uh, just increase uh, the ambition, uh, however it's possible to get started, and then uh, the, the regulation can can adopt. When when the uh, when the technology has proven it's uh, is worth. Mm -hmm. But you also said that you're quite happy with the approach. Eh? This is this is good. I just wanted to to yeah, underline. Yeah, sure. eh? So so uh, uh, Felipe. Yeah, uh, I think that actually the the framework, the legal frameworks, uh, ETS or the other initiatives, they are vital. Actually, uh, if we don't if if we don't have any incentive or 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 mechanism on that regard, it would be very difficult to go and move it on decarbonization. I only have two remarks. I believe that I we need to be like technology free when we are addressing the the legislation. We need neutral, to neutral, right? to... neutral. No. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, technology neutral because uh, what I mean on, on free that we. We can't lock in the technology, so we need uh, to focus on the goal that is uh, GAD mitigation, not specifically on one fuel rather than the other, but just that one that is more more effective. Uh, this is one point on the ETS integration internationally speaking. I think that is great, but this is only going to happen in an effective way when we standardize the way that we access sustainability. So we need to really have an international norm on providing this, the metrics so that we can compare uh, the, the, the profile, the life cycle profile of the fuels and the different technologies, actually. 
and uh, we need to be careful when we uh, have like a common pool for the ETS, because if we are allowed to buy allowances for other sectors, it's not likely that the investment from the carbon system will came back to the marine sector or it will stay in the marine sector because we can compensate with the other sectors, uh, which I can see from a global pers on a, on a, on a broader perspective, the benefits of compensating with other sectors because you just address uh, the, the issue with the cheapest and the simplest uh, way as possible, which is which is relevant, but uh, we just need to be concerned that to not uh, to not decrease the investment in a particular area because sooner or later all the sectors need to develop on the carbon on low carbon fuels or low carbon energy carriers or low carbon energy. So yeah, those are my three remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. One minute for you. I'll talk fast now. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Now, I think, only one minute. Eh? Yeah, many minute. good, yeah. many good things yeah. have been said. That this, I, I, I maybe just some few accents. Uh, one, one is that I, I think while the framework is very, very good and and it, it's in development and that is nice, uh, we see that the support framework, which is the general, is sometimes um, um, a bit different in in different countries. And that, that means that that rollout is sometimes a bit more difficult from one country to another country. Yeah, that, that's not an EU question, but more a member state question. Um, yeah, another one is, is uh, yeah, you know, it's a practical thing. If you are do these, uh, if you try to develop these technologies, then uh, up until pilot plant level, it is, it is very well possible. But at some point, then you go to these large, larger plants, which you need to demonstrate your technology. And then you have um, yeah, no income of, or, or not too much income from the plant, but you do have quite some investments. And I know that quite some things have been done there. Yeah, and I'm not really asking for more things, but it is an explanation that sometimes these developments go slower yeah, because if you go with these technologies, which, which you need to demonstrate at a reasonable scale, if you do that, um, the, the investments are, are quite substantial and also the, the running is quite substantial. So it takes time, money and investment. And yeah, that, that is, uh, goes slower than, than many want uh, and we, we, we include it. So um, yes, that, I, I think that that's mostly what I can add to, to everything. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Jakob, you raised, you, you want the second try? A, a short comment. Uh, I agree with uh, Felipe that the technology neutrality is very important. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of uh, asking for a carbon tax, a flat carbon tax, that, that the, the industry will, will choose the right uh, technologies to, to reach that target. Uh, that's important. And I think uh, measuring of emissions, including the methane emissions from all these LNG terminals being, uh, being uh, installed uh, at the moment, I think that's really important because we're very concerned that LNG will be a major fuel in the shipping industry because we don't believe that it, it is as green as, as claimed because the, the emissions are not fully measured and they are based on a 100-year period uh, calculation that we don't think makes sense when the climate crisis is, is needed to be solved in, in a few decades. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, I believe uh, the reason for even us Germans being fast on the LNG terminals has nothing to do with the environment. <laughs> I, I agree on that. So um, um, Ma we, we, Maria, we believe I, that I, LNG has been introduced uh, to, 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 to get into compliance to sulfur emissions. And, and to do that, it, it's a, a very good fuel. But on climate, it's, uh, it's quite challenging to, okay. to get results. Yeah, thanks, Jakob, for this uh, addition. Uh, so we are approaching the end. Uh, oh, Patrick again, sorry. Another yeah, yes. I think if Jakob gets an afterburner, then, then maybe just some things. It's about the sustainability uh, requirements. Uh, I, th I think, first of all, they're, they're very important, uh, also from the public acceptance. Um, however, it's it's very good that, uh, that the stable framework is there, because uh, if you have this uh, technology development and these investments, those are long-term commitments. And uh, yeah, moving targets uh, um, are cause for uncertainty in the market. And uh, that, that really does not help a lot uh, in, in investment decisions. 
Um, and maybe also a general comment. I think it's also good that sustainability issues also for new developments uh, like methanol, like um, 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 how do you say the, the uh, ammonia. It's also good to look already quite good at early stages at the sustainability aspects of those technologies because everything looks wonderful if it's in the laboratory but um, if it is implemented uh, and and you find out the problems then then you are uh, yeah you are maybe in a in a uh, how do you say in a in a wrong wrong branch yeah, and it's, it's good to try to get as proper as possible uh, as soon as possible proper sustainability assessments on also on those new technologies yeah certainly correct patrick thanks a lot um maria would you want to uh, to respond to some of the uh, i think most comments were really nice there but if you <laughs> i would like to give oh, you yeah. <laughs> well i listen to the messages technology neutrality sustainability carbon tax uh, what else i need um, uh, political for stability framework, uh, stability. Um, what I can say is that uh, pretty much now the framework is, uh, is done uh, with uh, the um, Fit for Fit 55 or the legislation which has been amended or the new legislation. For example, the fuel uh, EU maritime uh, has a specific reference uh, to this uh, in, new alternative fuels that you can use. And this can be green methanol, it could be renewable methanol, it could be green ammonia, it could be uh, renewable ammonia, it could be uh, all these types of biofuels or renewable fuels of non-biological origin. And in the red too, you have a specific target for those RFNBOs, not only hydrogen, but also hydrogen derived fuels from renewable uh, energy. And they are even higher in target uh, than the advanced uh, biofuels. And you have this 13% savings uh, of greenhouse gas emissions in all uh, energy uh, supplied to transport, renewable energy, electricity, or fuels. So all these uh, somehow give uh, the stable political environment for, this, uh, for the developments. And now the repowering group comes with a name to even um, make um, uh, more um, more intense uh, the necessity to have these uh, technologies for the energy security, but also for the for the environment. These are uh, technologies that serve both uh, targets. Um, so that's for the uh, stability. Uh, then for the technology neutrality, I think there are many. Uh, all of the technologies there it could be fuel cells that are using these. Uh, uh, fuels, it could be uh, the different fuels in the existing uh, uh, engines, it could be uh, the um, uh, electric FEPs, for example, the batteries, and uh, we support in research in hydrogen, um, we support in uh, research and innovation, all of these types. So uh, if this is not technology neutrality, unless you mean uh, we include the uh, fossil based uh, fuels, which uh, at some part also in uh, fuel uh, in humanity time, I think the use of recycled recycle carbon fuels is allowed, but I have to, to check on this to be 100% uh, sure. Um, so there is technology, I mean, we support, and because we also understand that only if you have many uh, technologies, diverse technologies, you can achieve uh, faster the, the target and better the target. Uh, Maria, you... I, I think uh, I, I, I think we only have a half a minute left, and I, I want I try to avoid that it will just make boom, and then we all we all leave. W would that be okay? No, if, that's uh, it. That's it from I, me. That uh, I take sorry. a lot of what you're saying, but a lot of these things are already supported. Many, many thanks. Sorry, sorry for that, but I was just informed. So many, many thanks from my side. I think it was a very interesting workshop. Um, last words to John, who is the coordinator of this music workshop, who, which featured the present workshop. Quickly, John. Well, quickly. Uh, thanks yeah. everybody yeah. for your, for your inputs, for your patience, etc. Uh, I think we had a very good uh, meeting today. Good discussion. Good moderation. Uh, many things to think about and to work on in the future. So once again, thanks everybody also for our audience today. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Good. Bye bye. Thank you very much.
Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye.